So let's start. So in the last class, we learned about uh, uh, how you know uh, instability to heterogeneous perturbations arises. Okay, from diffusion. So this is called diffusion-induced instability, and also very famously known as Turing patterns, or also Turing instability. So I'm going to uh, sort of you know uh, uh, talk about more about these Turing patterns today in the context of biological systems. Okay. So, so, uh, so Alan Turing, uh, the uh, famous computer scientist uh, you may have heard about, uh, had this remarkable idea that uh, sort of, you know, no simple physics can, on chemistry, can explain morphogenesis, okay? So what I am going to do today is, you know, from this paper, I'm going to uh, show some uh, sort of, you know, uh, snippets from his paper, and I strongly encourage that you read the paper. Okay, so this was in 1952. Uh, so, so this is from the abstract. So, and also the writing style of the, I don't know, how, I'm sure that at some stage uh, by now, most of we have read uh, some research paper, right? And, uh, and I'm assuming most of those papers, I mean, some of those papers probably will be, you know, uh, uh, classics, uh, sort of, you know, maybe from 70s, 80s, 60s, and this is even before that time. And uh, if you compare the style of writing, it's actually remarkably different, you know, the, 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 the current style of writing in 2000s onwards, and the style of writing that people used to adopt in 1950s, probably through even 80s, uh, late 80s are actually remarkably different. So I thought because of that reason, I wanted to just quote a few things he says, and it's uh, very interesting the way he says. So this is the first sentence of the paper. He says that it is suggested that a system of chemical substances called morphogens uh, reacting together and diffusing through a tissue is adequate to account for the main phenomena of morphogenesis. Okay, uh, such a system, although it may originally be quite homogeneous, may later develop a pattern or structure due to an instability of the homogeneous equilibrium, which is triggered off by random disturbances. Uh, and you know, uh, now that we actually have learned the mathematical phenomena, I think what he's saying hopefully now makes slightly more sense than uh, if you have, if you were to just jump into this and you know, read. So the basic sort of, you know, idea that sort of, you know, sort of implicit here and the contrast that he is bringing out here is the fact that when you have an equilibrium and when you have a diffusion, we often think of uh, systems having homogeneous equilibrium, uh, but in some chemical systems under diffusion, uh, homogeneous equilibrium could be unstable and that could be triggered entirely by random disturbances. And he goes on uh, say, to say that such reaction diffusion systems are considered in some detail in the case of an isolated ring of cells, a mathematically convenient though biologically unusual system. The investigation is chiefly concerned with the onset of instability. It is found that there are six essentially different forms which this may take. By the way, I think I haven't listed all the six here. I have only listed a few here. Uh, in the most interesting forms, stationary waves appear on the ring. It is suggested that this, is, this might account, for instance, for the tentacle patterns of on hydra or walled leaves. Uh, a system of reactions and diffusion on a sphere is also considered. So the, uh, you know, the previous sentence is talking about, I think, the ring, but this is now a sphere. The system appears to account for gastrulation. Another reaction system in two dimension gives, gives rise to patterns reminiscent of dappling. It is also suggested that stationary waves in two dimensions could account for the phenomena of phylotaxis. Okay, so he's trying to use this simple idea that reaction diffusion systems can have homogeneous equilibrium turning to unstable and that these can ex explain a bunch of patterns we see in the biological systems in the context of morphogenesis. Okay, and he continues, this is still abstract by the way, it's a long abstract, two paragraphs of the abstract. The, and, uh, the purpose of this paper is to discuss a possible mechanism by which the genes of a zygote may determine the anatomical structure of the resulting organism. 
and uh, he goes on to say the theory does not make any new hypothesis it merely suggests that certain well known physical laws are sufficient to account for many of the facts now this is a very interesting way of writing paper in, in this day today if you were to say my theory makes new hypothesis or no new predictions people will say why are you publishing it you know please you know send it somewhere else don't publish in our journal okay so time, times have changed dramatically uh, uh, the full understanding of the paper requires a good knowledge of mathematics some biology and some elementary chemistry since readers cannot be expected to be experts in all of these subjects a number of elementary facts are explained which can be found in textbooks but whose omission would make the paper difficult reading so it's actually a fairly long paper uh, you know by today's standards we just will not have the patience to read through it entirely uh, so this is a really long paper you know some sections that sort of you know that just deeply discuss the assumptions and uh, what are the implications uh, and some sections introducing mathematics some sections introducing chemistry some sections introducing biology you know it's very very interestingly written okay so now he moves on to, that's the end of abstract by the way now then he moves on to introduction so in this section a mathematical model of the growing embryo will be described this model will be a simplification and an idealization and consequently a falsification i don't fully understand the last phrase consequently a falsification uh, but the first part is clear uh, so this account and you know he's very clear about you know how this uh, his approach or the modeling omits lots of features now i am taking some pieces from here and there it's not you know up to the, the abstract i sort of fully showed you this is you know only in bits and pieces now he now says this account of the problem omits many features example electrical properties and the internal structure of the cell but even so it is a problem of formidable mathematical complexity one cannot at present hope to make any progress with the understanding of systems except in very simplified cases i think even if for for every paper we write today on uh, that sort of tries to address biological uh, systems a sentence of this type will be true because you know perhaps you know even later in, later in time also you know uh, but you know mathematical modeling will necessarily be uh, simple and uh, will be considered only in simplified cases in this paper it is proposed to give attention rather to cases where the mechanical aspect can be ignored and the chemical aspect is the most significant so when he says mechanical aspect i think he probably means that when two cells are nearby there are many mechanical forces stresses strains um, and uh, you know the forces between them all those can be ignored but the chemical reaction and how uh, two interacting chemicals give rise to you know a chemical reaction that's the aspect that is most significant or the one that is focused here so then uh, in the second section he introduces uh, sort of you know uh, Uh, relevant mathematical knowledge i mean of course you know to be clear you know to understand this as we now know right you need to know basics of differential equations in fact just linear differential equations and you need to know basics of simple matrix algebra calculating eigen values eigen vectors you do need to have some basic calculus for example for the last part that i did not do in the class i uh, you know the you know we showed necessary condition in the previous class right but did not show what is the sufficient condition so the sufficient condition requires some calculations which i you know so this requires some small amount of calculus of course you do need to know the fourier series right so uh, you know those uh, you know those you know those knowledge are important but once you have those the rest of the algebra the stuff it is basically algebra okay so in section 3 i thought sort of forget what it was i think it was more, more about chemistry or, or the uh, morphogenesis biology and in section 4 he considers this idea of breakdown of symmetry and homogeneity okay uh, so what do we mean by that you know we remember remember we discussed this idea of uh, homogeneous equilibrium right and then perturbations can uh, cause uh, you know break that homogeneity and that's precisely what he's talking about 
breakdown of symmetry and homogeneity. So the breakdown of homogeneity, I hope, will be clear to everyone, right? So the homogeneous equilibrium and the perturbation did not bring the system back. But the perturbation that we made to this homogeneous equilibrium uh, did not die off, right? Uh, you know, uh, so that's the breakdown of homogeneity. What about breakdown of symmetry? Okay. Now that's an aspect we haven't explicitly discussed in this class. Uh, I will try to discuss this once again later. So broadly speaking, uh, you no know, symmetry is an extremely important concept in physics. Okay. Uh, so let us think about symmetry. I'll just hide this for the for a few seconds. Okay. So we don't you know end up reading too much of. Okay. So uh, so for example, uh, think of hundreds or thousands of particle moving in a two dimensional world okay what are all the symmetries in the system can somebody think about what are all the symmetries in the system if you need more information let me know You mean like symmetries across x, y, z axis? You yeah, you decide. Yeah, one is one. That's perfectly valid way of thinking. Symmetries around with respect to time. With respect to time, absolutely yes, yes. So can you be more precise now? What do you mean by symmetries about x, y, z axis? So let me give you two examples. One example where there are thousands of particles. They're all doing Brownian motion. Okay, think of the screen itself as the two-dimensional world. Now, then imagine there are you know hundreds or thousands of um, particles doing Brownian motion. Think of a contrasting system where all these particles are moving in, moving along the x direction. Let's say from left to the right of the screen. Okay, uh, can you tell me which of the two systems has more symmetry? So one system where particles are moving randomly, another system where all the particles are moving towards right, from left to right on the screen. And in the left to right one? That has more symmetry. Is yeah. that what okay, I'm just curious. So I have, there are only two choices, no A and B, right? I just want to see how many of you think the answer is, uh, how many of you go with Bevan here? How many of you think that uh, the system where all particles are moved from left to right has more symmetry? One, two, seven, of course, three. But people be brave. How to be brave? Can I take it that the rest 16 people, okay, including me, the 18 people now. So can I assume that, uh, okay, three. Does it mean the rest of the 14 people think that, so can read out down your hands now, think that the Brownian motion has more symmetry? Okay, now, now let me take the vote. I mean, some people may have no opinion on this, so it's okay. So how many of you think that the answer is that Brownian motions moving all around randomly, that is more symmetric? One person, three people on that? Four? Oh, this is, this is interestingly more answers okay 11 okay that's great so thank you very much so please uh, lower your hand so 11 people thought that brownian motion particle had more symmetry uh, three people thought that uh, particles from left to right had more symmetry uh, and the other five people had no opinion okay uh, so so surprisingly uh, the answer indeed is uh, the Brownian motion particles who are all going around randomly, uh, that system has more symmetry. Can one of you explain why? What is that compared to the, the, the uh, all particles move from left to right? What is the extra symmetry that the system has? Is it the extra ax axis? 
uh, access is a symmetry okay maybe yeah slightly more like precise answer something like spherical or like mm -hmm. that's a good guess anybody else samvita yes. yeah so if uh, from the in the example where the particles are moving it has only one direction mm -hmm. so there's less chance of being of achieving symmetry in that right so from that perspective Whereas in Brownian motion, they are randomly moving in all directions. Uh -huh. That's why more symmetry. There is no one particular direction towards which it is biased. Okay, excellent. Yeah, that indeed is the answer. You know that you know um, you know in when all part when particles are all, um, Brownian particles, uh, there is no direction to pick. All directions are equal, right? Okay, so in whereas in the in the con in the case where everybody has moved from left to right, uh, for example, you know um, that could be a example of cell migration from you know one direction to the other, one organ to the other, or it could be an example of uh, uh, birds flocking from one you know one site to another site. Okay, so where they have picked a specific direction. So the fact that they have all picked a specific direction means that the directional symmetry is broken okay so surprisingly what appears more ordered actually has less symmetry okay uh, uh, so that's actually slightly counterintuitive if you think of symmetry we think of symmetry often as things having a proper pattern uh, but the symmetry if you think deeply is basically all things being equal and one such is you know angular symmetry is one such and there are other types of symmetries one can talk talk, talk about for example uh, now angle is one the other one is you know space if you just move from one one place to the other place right will life look similar will the world look similar okay so that would be called translational symmetry if i move from one part of the screen to another part of screen will the world look same again in the brownian context it will look same uh, now in the context of you know this uh, particles moving from left to right probably that 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 symmetry is still maintained okay that symmetry hasn't been broken so 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 usually we associate you know instability or you know with the breakdown of symmetry okay so in this case we have to see what symmetries are broken you know it's not very evident okay uh, without looking at the actual patterns that you have at your hand okay so 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 he's talking broadly about this concept of breakdown of symmetry and homogeneity. I don't quite remember how well the breakdown of symmetry is explained in this section, but you know, when you read, you will know. Okay. Okay. So now he talks, uh, going back to the paper now, the way he describes. So there appears uh, superficially a difficulty confronting this theory of morphogenesis. So he's talking about the symmetries, by the way. An embryo in its spherical blastula stage has a spherical symmetry but a system which has spherical symmetry and whose state is changing because of chemical reaction and diffusion will remain spherically symmetric forever okay so he's basically trying to argue that a spherically symmetric system with chemical reaction and diffusion will remain symmetrically forever the same would hold true if the state were changing according to laws of electricity magnetism or quantum mechanics okay so usually i think you know this notion that you know simple physical laws cannot break symmetry uh, is 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 a, is a very important concept in physics okay you need something fundamental to happen to break symmetries okay uh, so that's why he's giving this example of physics here uh, it certainly cannot result in an organism such as horse which is not spherically symmetrical okay uh, so basically he's saying that if you start with an embryo which is spherical how on the earth we got a horse or whatever the animal that we are talking about which is which has lost this spherical symmetry okay now of course the typical biological argument for this is hey look biology is complex you know the genes express differently in different parts of uh, you know embryo okay therefore things become uh, you know uh, heterogeneous over time right so that's one, of course, nobody is, I'm not ruling that out, ruling that out. And I don't think Turing himself is ruling that possibility out either. 
uh, but what he's basically trying to show is that uh, uh, even within the realm of simple chemical reaction and diffusion, it is possible to break this symmetry and homogeneity. Okay, and then he goes on to say that this argument actually has a fallacy. It was assumed that the deviations from the spherical symmetry in the blast could be ignored because it makes no particular difference what form of asymmetry there is. Okay. Uh, and this is something you know reasonable, right? You know, we of course expect deviations from this spherical symmetry in any real system, but you know, most likely that should have no effect, okay, on the sort of you know broader principles of homogeneity and symmetry. Uh, that's a, that's a sort of an argument. But he's saying that's actually a fallacious argument, not a correct argument. Uh, he's arguing that it is, however, important that there are some deviations for the system may reach a state of instability. In which these irregularities are certain components of them tend to grow. If this happens, a new unstable equilibrium is usually reached with the symmetry entirely gone. So, with the virgin virginal symmetry, in this case, spherical symmetry entirely gone. So, he's verbally trying to argue it is indeed possible. And of course, then goes on to show mathematically how he arrives at those. Okay? And then in section six, I am skipping the section five here, which mostly talks about chemical reaction. He does the kind of mathematics that we did in our class on Friday. Okay, he take considers this ring of cells. Uh, why ring, why a ring of cells? You know, you should think of ring of cells as basically a one-dimensional arrangement of cells, but with periodic boundary condition. Okay, so that would give you a ring of cells. Okay, uh, so I'm urging that do read sections four and five on your own. He gives examples of breakdown of homogeneity with just numerical, simple verbal arguments. It's only in section six that he takes the analytical treatment of this. No, you know, this is no, this is a really amazing in some ways, in my opinion, uh, in the sense that you know, Alan Turing was, you know, uh, sort of you know, uh, one of the people think of it as you know, prodigy. One of the you know, if you had to pick top prodigies in the last uh, you know century, he would be one of them, right? In you know, along with Einstein and the others, right? Uh, you know, in terms of the contribution he made, and as well as how or what sort of a genius he was, but if you look at and 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 of course his mathematical abilities were incredible, right? Now, but you know he he takes enormous pain <laughs> if I were to use that word to make sure that the argument mathematical arguments are written down in a way that's accessible to people, you know, and that was that point was made uh, very clearly in the abstract or the early introduction part, right? You know, he makes enormous emphasis, enormous efforts to emphasize the biology, chemistry, as well as the mathematics, and tries to make these as accessible as possible. Okay. Um, but he does say that, you know, between sections six and nine, it is probably a bit more mathematical. And then what he does is, you know, in the last section, again, he tries to make sure he summarizes all those findings in uh, verbal, simple verbal arguments. Okay. So what he has done is, you know, he considers two morphogens X and Y, and then he looks at the stability of perturbations from the equilibrium, and he knows he denotes it by X R and Y R. As you can see, the first two terms are basically linear terms. So X R is the perturbation from the from the equilibrium for X. Y R is the perturbation of the morphogen from its equilibrium Y star. And what you are seeing here is basically the linear expansion around the equilibrium. Those are the first two terms in both the equations. What about this term? Do you recognize what is this term? The Laplacian. That's the discretized Laplacian. Okay. So R stands for the spatial location. Okay. And uh, and this represents a discretized Laplacian. And it is this is precisely what we do when we discretize for numerical numerical integration, right? Okay. Uh, so those are the Laplacian. Okay, now R basically is the location, R is location along the, you know, uh, along the ring. Okay, and then the next step that it does is basically uh, substitute X and R as you know as uh, the perturbations as you know, Fourier series. That's what it does. And then I know does the algebra. I know much more. And the algebra is you know he dwells different geometries, right? You know ring. Uh, also uh, a sphere and sort of carefully analyzes how these perturbations grow or decay, okay? 
So I won't do all of that, okay? Because we have already done that in the class on Friday. And, you know, I certainly do encourage and go back and redo as many of the calculations he does between six, 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 six seven, and eight. Six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So, and what he does in uh, section 10 uh, is a numerical simulation. Okay, you know, you know, he's not stopping with his analytical theory. He very well could have because he's a mathematically prolific. Uh, he was a mathematically prolific scientist, right? You know, so, but, you know, he takes pains to actually do numerical simulation. Uh, I actually don't know how he did, maybe calculator, he, but he, he, he does with really, really small system size, just 20 cells. You can see 0, 1, up to 19, and after 19, has 0 again. Now, 20 cells on a periodic boundary condition. 20 cells on a line, but the periodic boundary condition becomes uh, you know, a ring. And then what he shows here are you know, initial uh, values of morphogens. You know, it's heterogeneous. You know, uh, some values around 1.1. And why is some value around one? Okay, but heterogeneous, you no know, input. And then he he then calculates the final pattern, you no know, asymptotically, uh, sort of you know steady state equilibrium. But you can see very clearly, right? You know, seven four, seven six, nine point nine, one point seven, one point seven, point eight, point seven, point six. You no, know, it's increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing. And you can even see that you know seven one one. Repeats 711, 711, 1.707, 1.706, okay, uh, 0.875, 0.927. So it's not perfectly a periodic system, but it it appears like you know there are some repetitions, right? You know, again, you know, basically increasing, decreasing, you no know, increasing, again, decreasing again. Same with y, morphogen y, 1.44, 1.2, 1.2, to zero. 1.3, 1.6, 1.6, 1.3, 0.0, 1.2. Again, you know, you can, again, you can see some sort of repetition, not necessarily exactly periodic, but there is a repetition. And the asymptotically stable equilibrium is not homogeneous. The final pattern is not homogeneous. Okay. He shows this with really, really small system size, but a useful one. Is this clear to everyone? Okay. And this is the plot of what he has found. So is the concentrations of Y in the development of first specimen taken from table one. So, you know, this dashed line is the homogeneous of the mean field equilibrium. And, uh, you know, uh, this hashes, hashes are, I think what he initially introduced as an input. Okay, and then the solid line is the final equilibrium. You can see now solid line. You know, around 1.5, 1.5 drops off to zero, then climbs up again, drops off to zero. Okay, so you see some, some repetition, okay? So basically the final equilibrium is not a homogeneous equilibrium anymore. So any questions up to this point because I'm now moving on from this paper. Okay, I think I have one more thing, okay? So final paragraph of the paper, you know, again, I would encourage you to read the, uh, law, you know, as much of the paper as possible, even if you skip the mathematical one, do read the other sections because uh, he takes, I already said, as I already said, you know, real lot of care in trying to model a biological system and trying to be very careful in what he is modeling, what he is not modeling, and trying to be careful in uh, making inferences about what it means for a biological system. Okay, so this is the last paragraph. It must be admitted that the biological examples which it has been possible to give in the present paper are very limited. This can be ascribed quite simply to the fact that biological phenomena are usually very complicated. Taking this in combination with the relatively elementary mathematics used in this paper, one could hardly expect to find that many observed biological phenomena would be covered. It is thought, however, that the imaginary biological system which have been treated and the principles which have been discussed should be of some help in interpreting real biological forms. Fairly modest, uh, okay, uh, final paragraph. Okay, so you can now ask the following question, right? You know, we do see a lot of these patterns which are a consequence of morphogenesis, right? Uh, you know, I have taken some slides from a 
talk by Shweta Brasina, who is an IMSC Chennai. I will actually give link to his entire presentation because it's, uh, he has a full length talk on do we really observe during patterns in the nature? Okay, you know we certainly see lots of patterns. You know I don't, especially the ecologists in the audience. I don't have to tell you. You look at the, uh, you know the patterns of wings on butterfly, or you look at the coat patterns in animals, be tiger, cheetah, or uh, you know, uh, other types of cats or even zebras. Uh, or, you know, in this case on the right-hand side here, the patterns on shells. There are this remarkable, you know, periodic patterns. Or pe no, 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 even if they are not strictly periodic in the mathematical sense, they're as close to periodic you know, as you can get in the real world probably, right? And uh, so are they also a consequence of during patterns? Is one question that people started thinking uh, when they start, you know, when they understood, uh, you know, the sort of importance of Turing, uh, Turing's papers. Uh, for a large time, uh, I don't think anybody really believed that Turing was right for a, for the very simple reason that we all know the condition. You know, just remember the conditions that were required. You remember you need an activator and inhibitor uh, as two chemicals, right? You know, one that grows itself. Uh, as well as uh, on its own, as well as also facilitates the growth of the other. But the inhibitor tries to kill both the morphogens, right? You, know, you need something like that. That in itself is not too hard. You do have activated inhibitor systems. However, people thought that, you know, in, a, in any chemical systems, typically the diffusion constants are determined by the media they are in, right? And, and, uh, and, and the sort of, you know, temperature and these kind of properties, right? So, you know, any, any chemical system which are mixed, where two chemicals are mixed, often the diffusivities are actually nearly identical, which, you know, if you remember correctly from the previous class, that is exactly the opposite of the condition we require for the Turing patterns to emerge. You know, we need diffusion constant of the inhibitor to be substantially higher than the diffusion constant of the activator okay now to achieve two very different when i say very different you know if you actually put numbers it will become clear you often need an order of magnitude or even preferably larger uh, differences in the two chemicals speeds or the diffusion constants okay so people thought that's just very very hard to do okay uh, so you know this talk by the president covers that ground by survey okay so uh, and then you can also again ask, you know, people were thinking for a long time, do we, you know, these kind of patterns we see, for example, on cheetahs, right? You know, in cheetah, on the body, you see these spotted patterns, on the tail, you see these, you know, ring patterns, okay? Uh, and, you know, and likewise, you know, if you look at different types of cats, you find all these different kind of patterns. And there is this very, uh, really great book uh, called Mathematical Biology by J.D. Murray. He proposed a, small, a simple model uh, which I think is a small modification of the original Turing that accounts for the geometry of these animals' body and then shows that it is actually possible, you know, the A, B, C are actually the results of numerical simulations of his reaction diffusion systems, okay? He shows that it is possible to obtain these patterns, okay? Now, despite the fact that people were able to reproduce the patterns that you do on you do, you do see on real animals, people were not convinced for a very long time that the observed patterns are because of curing mechanisms. Maybe it's because of some other mechanism, you know, it could be a consequence of uh, sort of, you know, heterogeneity express, expressed in, uh, in uh, at certain level of, you know, uh, genetic or molecular uh, pattern for, you know, development of the organism. Uh, so, uh, but you know, until you know, I think if I'm right, only in the last two decades or so, uh, when people actually began to observe during you know uh, systems in both controlled uh, chemical systems as well as uh, biological systems. So I will send you some articles on that. I am not going to do a good job of covering that ground today. There are some nice articles that cover that ground. Okay, I will, I will send you those links. Okay. So now I'm going to switch case. And I'm going to look at possibilities of curing patterns now, all the way from animal body body plants to really large scale ecosystems at the level of uh, landscapes. Okay, 
Uh, so before I do this, do any questions, any comments so far? Because I have been talking and nobody's talking. Sir, I asked you this question a few weeks back and you replied something, but I didn't understand, sir. Uh, sure, sure. Tell me. Why Just don't you me. consider diagonal uh, cells in the Laplacian? Ah, uh, but you know, I thought also uh, Chandan, right? You asked this question over, uh, you know, I think message if I'm right. Yes, sir. Ha, huh, but you know, if we just derive, if we just do a Brownian motion in two dimensions, okay, uh, if that is indeed assumption, and uh, you derive and uh, do you actually find uh, diagonal terms? Do you, do you find dou by dou x, dou by dou y terms there? Uh, probably, sir. Why don't you try it out and tell me? Okay. Okay. If you, if you, if you do fine, let me know. Okay. Okay. Huh. I think I gave you the same answer then also, which means I still haven't answered your question. But okay. please try it out on your own. You can do because I have shown you how to do it in 1D. Just do it in 2D and let, let me know if you find a cross term. Okay. Okay. That's a good question though. Huh? So it depends on what we are trying to say, you know, if you, you know, depend in some, of course, systems, you do find cross terms. I'm not denying cross terms don't arise, but my question, my point is, if you start with Brownian motion, do you find cross terms or not? Okay. Okay. So sir, one PDF. More sure. Uh, what's the reaction function that Turing considered? Oh, he didn't consider any reaction. I think he just considered linear. Okay, sir. Oh, I mean, oh, for the simulation model, is that what you mean? Huh. There, of course, you must have considered something else. I don't remember, you know, please read. Huh? Yes. Only for the linear stability analysis, of course, you will consider the linear one. But for the, uh, because, you know, but if you start just do with the linear, it only shows there is a instability, but it doesn't tell you where it goes, right? So you do need to have higher order terms that will dampen the growth from the uh, unstable equilibrium, right? So he does explain that clear, the numerical example he explains that very nicely. No? Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering uh, about animal symmetries. Mm -hmm. Even though the uh, so when they're uh, in the zygote form, uh, as Alan Turing points out, they're spher spherically symmetrical, mm -hmm. but even for instance, in his example of the horse, the horse is still bilaterally symmetrical. Mm -hmm. So how does this sort of, I, I don't understand the connection there. Like just because, is it just, uh, does Turing's model incorporate different types of symmetries as well? Or is it just about how uh, uh, periodic perturbations can cause like asymmetrical patterns? Uh -huh. So, so remember that the symmetries depend on the also on the geometry you choose, right? So as, you know, if you are trying to sort of uh, model uh, growth in 3D, you start with the spherical symmetry, and then you know, uh, then you think about uh, how the body shape evolves, right? Uh, body, okay, and that's one part, right? Now that would be different if we had a different type of uh, geometry for the you know reactions and diffusion to happen okay so so geometry to some extent it reminds the symmetry that is there in the system okay now what this is trying to show is that uh, in the simple linear stability analysis we did right in that class that doesn't really account for geometry at all right it sort of thinks of you know you're basically working with a idealized system there uh, where the boundary effects are not playing a role at all okay? which means in another word, another way of saying the same thing is, you know, system is infinitely large. Okay. Uh, now, uh, so in such system, so what, what this uh, book and some of the ideas by Murray says is that, you know, the, the geometrical shape of the objects uh, over, over which reaction and diffusion are happening, all else being equal alone can explain the differentiation in the patterns. For example, tail, why, you know, although you actually have a, basically think of, you know, see the, uh, so this part of the body, right, where I'm now pointing the mouse, can be approximated as a plane, right, as flat 2D world, right. However, the tail 
is more of a cylindrical okay uh, cylindrical world right okay now and uh, that together with some rates of reactions okay and the sort of you know for example in this specific case c right as you go from you know slightly thicker tail to a narrow tail the spots are becoming basically getting merged and becoming stripes okay so you know this geometrical effect can also explain differentiation in the patterns although the underlying sort of physics or the chemistry is still the same so that's the point of this i hope i explained it clearly yeah. i hope other, other, I, I do I, I have not forgotten what was your question <laughs> but i hope i explained it yeah yeah i got it. so yeah in theory like we can overlay multiple uh, uh, symmetry breaking steps mm -hmm. to uh, break my symmetries like to yeah. get a body plan like say yeah. after other there can be other mechanisms yeah 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 so would that be okay if I, a okay statement i think so yeah yeah you know different uh, symmetry breaking mechanisms can coexist and they will operate over different spatial and temporal scales fair enough absolutely you know? but they can be layered in a way they can be layered in a way yeah when you say layered i i, I use a slightly different word which i think i interpret it as you know they are happening at different spatial and temporal scales okay is it fair enough yeah, yeah. Hmm? okay 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 so now let's move on to the uh, you know application of these turing patterns and diffusion in induced instability at landscape level so you now first of all let me just motivate this by showing that these kind of patterns also emerge when we look at ecosystem levels so a a is an example of field observation a to c in fact or they are all observations from arid ecosystems a is an example of a labyrinthine pattern of bushy vegetations in niger okay niger if i am right is in uh, uh, you know close to sahara I'm not sure if it's exactly in sahara though okay is that right please correct me if any of you uh, know no the exact location i'm slightly confused that niger is in israel or is it a different location okay please excuse me if i'm wrong so b is an example again of in in the same geographical area stripe pattern of the the same type of vegetation so between a and b the vegetation type are same but the patterns you are observing are different okay c is again a labyrinthine pattern a and c have similar similar pattern but it produces something really striking observe the scale so this a is a landscape of maybe 250 meters by 250 meters the picture is of the has that scale whereas c is just 1 meter by 1 meter but they have very similar pattern so c is an example basically the vegetation there is actually are basically grasses okay so c is labyrinth of perennial grass in israel okay and look let's go d and e d and e are savanna ecosystems okay so these are called spotted patterns you know if you look close up you see that there is a mosaic of trees and grasses and uh, let's look at uh, f f and g they are peatlands okay regular maze patterns of shrubs and you know trees in western siberia uh, okay and you know these three have similar scales you know they are all roughly and you know uh, you know landscape level too you know like you know 250 meters by at least you know this x axis here 250 meters i mean what you are seeing on the far there is probably really in sort of kilometers away uh and g something similar with g okay so so this is a sort of just to give an example of how what appears like regular uh, sort of you know uh, pattern formation and whether you know the so one hypothesis one can come up with is that you know maybe these are also induced by turing instability sort of patterns okay so there were several papers in early 2000s that claim this and this paper in 2004 uh, sort of does a review of those uh, you know models mathematical models and then 
uh, sort of provides a synthesis. Okay, so what I will now do is show you one such mathematical model by Reed Kirk et al., which was published in American Naturalist in 2002. Okay, so in this model, it is trying to basically explain these varieties of patterns of vegetation, okay, in on similar landscapes, like you know, spotted labyrinthine, and these kind of patterns. Okay, so let us see what this model does. Okay, this model has three partial differential equations. Okay. Now, so far up to now, you are all hopefully comfortable with one partial differential equation. And on Friday, we have also studied two partial differential equations. Okay, now this is three. Okay, but fundamentally, nothing really changes between two and three. So hopefully, uh, I mean, at least within the parameter regime that we are discussing. Okay, so, so what this model assumes are the following. Okay, it first assumes that there are three state variables that are important. To understand these vegetation patterns. One is that of surface water, second is that of soil water, third is, of course, the plant biomass, which you really want to explain. Okay. So let's see how they model surface water dynamics. So O is the surface water. So the partial derivative at any location x, how does the surface water change? So surface water increases because of this input parameter R which basically stands for rainfall. So in my cropping, I have sort of missed the labeling here, rainfall. So R stands for rainfall. So there's a rainfall rate because of which surface water increases. However, what happens to surface water? It undergoes, you know, if I ignore this, you know, complex P plus W0, K2, ignore this big term here. Just think of the first term, minus alpha O. What does this first this term mean, minus alpha O mean? Evaporation. Evaporation. Okay, now no, no, basically it's not evaporation as I have written in the blue fonts here. So they are not modeling evaporation of surface water, but what they are doing is that uh, they are assuming that there is an infiltration. So there is a loss of surface water because of infiltration. Okay, so they are assuming that the first thing that happens when the uh, rain happens is, and of course, uh, you know, there is you know, surface water fills up, and surface water, the first thing that happens is it actually undergoes infiltration. So this infiltration is a function of amount of plant. So what is this term capturing? You know, are you able to see my mouse cursor, by the way? I can do a laser pointer if it helps. Are you able to see it now? Okay, imagine this term was not there. Okay, this P term, P plus W0, K to divide by P plus. But if this term was not there, that would mean that there is a, there's an infiltration that is independent of all other things. Okay, but what this term, this ratio uh, that depends on P implies is the following. It implies that presence of plants influences the infiltration rates. Okay, so consider the case when P is equal to zero, then basically P becomes zero and K2 gets cancelled. So what you have is just W0, right? So this entire term becomes W0 if there was no plant. But because there is no plant, this, uh, this ratio actually becomes more okay you should just check this out for yourself you should plot this function as a uh, function of p and convince yourself that as p increases the infiltration actually increases okay which means the surface water moves away from surface faster does that make biological sense to all of you especially all the ecologists plant biologists if there is plant that increases infiltration. Well, no response, I'll assume it's correct. Okay, the so third term is diffusion. You know, third term, as you know, basically models how the surface water that falls at a location spreads. The assumption is that the spreading of the surface water is diffusion. Okay, so are all the three terms of how surface water changes over time at a location reasonable to everyone? Any questions? Uh, so more number of plants will mean a uh, faster infiltration. Right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's the assumption of this model. Yes. So why exactly is that? If there's plants who they want it like block out water from immediately like sinking into the soil, if there's like uh, I'm not sure. Say that again. Why is that true? Uh, like, uh, yeah, like more plants won't it kind of create these sort of barriers to water like going deep, sinking deep into the soil. 
So, I mean, you know, mechanism, uh, one can discuss, you know, both are possible depending on the type of plant and type of soil, by the way. But there is certainly evidence that uh, in certain conditions of soil and certain conditions of plants, presence of plant does lead to higher infiltration. So there is certainly some evidence for that actually hypothesis. Okay, I, I, don't know the, I don't know the exact mechanism right away, uh, how this happens. Uh, so what is the K2 there? Some constant. Okay, so that's the first equation. Okay, about how surface water changes. Okay, and these are all very important questions. You know, so the so the entire field that studies how plants and water interact with one another in the landscape. That's a field in itself. Or you may have heard of the field of ecohydrology. And if ecohydrologists see this model, they will just throw it away, probably. Okay. Uh, but uh, you know, but this is a simple enough approximation which I like. Okay, uh, you know, uh, but one can easily think, uh, you know, argue that you know this is a very simplistic assumptions about how plants and uh, surface water interacts and how plant surface water moves, especially the diffusion of approximation. Okay, so because you know one can easily clear say that you know water doesn't really diffuse. Okay, they actually literally there is a drift. It really moves, uh, you know, uh, it's a flow, right? Okay, so, you know, there are, uh, you know, valid criticism, but this is a simplistic representation, you can say, but never there's very insightful. So that's what I just described was how the surface water changes. The so next thing is, is how the soil water, now that the surface water has seeped into soil, what happens? Okay, this is the the first term that you are seeing was basically the loss from the surface water basically becomes the gain of the soil water. And in fact, the assumption is that there is no intermediate loss. So everything that surface becomes uh, soil water. It's an assumption, you know, uh, important assumption, you know, uh, one can again question that's, the in, that's how the surface water increases, okay? Now, there are two loss terms. There are two minus terms, two loss terms. The last term is easy, which is that of evaporation. You know, uh, in the paper, they also said it could be drainage loss, but I think evaporation certainly makes a lot of sense. Uh, it could also be drainage in the following sense that, you know, there are, you know, you know, you know, in the sense that, you know, the, the deep soil absorption that happens, right? You know, um, so that, you know, it's what they're saying is it's a combination of the both. That is captured by this simple term minus RWW. Okay. And the next, this intermediate term is the water uptake by plants. Okay. And again, as you can see, this is not a linear. So, this, of course, is a linear function of P. Okay. As there is more plant, there is more uptake. However, there is also a nonlinear function of W. The reason is that, you know, if there is no water, there will be no uptake. So, there has to be a product of W1 P. However, there is some kind of a saturation of how much plants can take. So to account for that, they have built in this W by W plus K term. So this is similar to the functional responses we have seen in the past. You know, in fact, I think this is the type two functional response by Holling, right? So that's actually similar functional response. If W is the resource and P is the one that's consuming it, P is the consumer, uh, this basically captures the functional response of the resource uptake. Okay. So again, just to repeat, water changes in following three ways. The input comes from the uh, surface water, the, which in turn depends on the number of plants or the local plant density. There's a loss because the plants, uh, you know, uh, uptake this uh, surface of soil water. The assumption again is that the plant doesn't take water directly from the surface uh, because that's a very fast time scale phenomenon. It takes some soil water and then there is an evaporation and drainage loss. And finally, the soil water also spreads via diffusion. That's the spatial part of the model. So any questions on this? I don't promise to be able to answer uh, all the model assumptions, but we can discuss something.
Okay. So let me go to the next point. Okay, where are we? Okay. Finally, the plant. Okay. So whatever the plant uptake, that term becomes here with a conversion efficiency C, C G max W by W plus K1. And then there is minus DP, which basically captures how plants die. And there is you know diffusion of plants, which is uh, sort of you know an approximation for how plants spread via dispersal. Okay. Okay, so the key assumption of this model is that the space water, soil water, and plants, they all spread in space via diffusion, but with different diffusion constants. Okay, and then there is a feedback between plant and the water infiltration. Okay, these are the two key assumptions of these models. Do you all agree with this? This is one infiltration. It's also called positive feedback. More plants means better infiltration. Okay, uh, uh, and then uh, and, and and then of course there is the diffusion of all the three elements. Okay. Okay. Now, if you for the time you know whenever whenever you have this set of reaction diffusion equations, how do you go about solving them first? The first thing you should do is forget diffusion. Okay, is and then solve for the mean field results. So, what's the uh, non spatial model results? You know, these are actually fair, although there are they appear complex. It turns out that you can actually solve for the equilibrium for these three equations analytically. Yeah, they're actually fairly simple equations the P star, R star, and W star. There is actually a there are, there are only two equilibrium. You know, if R is zero, P O and uh, W, they will all be zero. If R is non-zero, okay, then there are you know two. You know, there's one more equilibrium, okay. Uh, you should be able, and you should, you should. It's also fairly easy to do stability analysis. If you do all these things, okay, this is the full model, by the way. You know, all the, all of them put together appears a bit complex, but you know, I hope I've explained it well. If you actually solve all the equilibrium of the mean field system and then find the bifurcation, this is how it looks like. As when R crosses up to R1, the plant equilibrium is basically zero, meaning it's an extinction equilibrium. But when R exceeds one, P increases linearly with R. So what bifurcation is this? And zero becomes unstable. Transcritical? This is a transcritical bifurcation, exactly. Okay. So great. Okay. So uh, so please check this, you know, I may have made a mistake, huh? please check this, you know, as we, as we, as you know, I will make mistakes. So don't take everything I say for granted. I expect that you verify everything I say in this class. Okay. Uh, so, so this is how the bifurcation diagram looks like. Now let us plug in diffusion. Okay. There are two things you can do. One is you can do the analytical calculation to check for Turing instability that can be done. One can also do simultaneously, but that only tells when the Turing whether Turing instability is possible in this model, and whether you uh, whether uh, uh, it exists. It doesn't really tell where it leads to, right? For that, you have to do simulations. So, if you do simulations with diffusion, you actually find these patterns for low values of R, which are actually less than the bifurcation value, where mean field model predicts extinction, what you find is something very interesting. You find that there is a spatial pattern of vegetation where you will find that there are these circular patches of vegetation uh, surrounded by bare areas. And as you increase the rainfall, you find these labyrinthine patterns of vegetation in this model. And if you increase R further, what you find is that, you know, there is this, the, the you know these, these two are inverse of one another okay here the you know the spots are actually bare areas everything else is vegetation okay uh, so this model says that as the rainfall increases you go through this progression of patches and one interesting conclusion from this spatial model analysis is that even when the mean field system expects no vegetation, you will actually find vegetation. And that is possible primarily because of spatial patterning. 
So what's effectively happening is that although resources are limited in this parameter regime, by concentrating themselves in some areas, they're actually, you know, gathering resources from neighboring areas and accumulating and therefore they're able to grow, okay? So spatial heterogeneity is helping system, you know, uh, be more productive than otherwise could have been, okay? So this is an example of possibility of Turing pattern in a vegetation system governed by those simple equations, okay? And we can also do simulations. I'll just show you these. These are actually all uh, taken from the same paper, by the way. Uh, see, so here I, I'm just showing you simulations. For this is low rainfall for, I think, R0.75. You start from random distribution of plants. You can see that, you know, um, they grow and they make these spotted patterns. And if you increase the rainfall and or in a medium rainfall regime, you find these labyrinth time patterns where these patches have grown and they sort of connect together. And if you increase the rainfall even further, you find these gap patterns, okay? Okay, so the darker regions are all plants and the, the, the circular areas are basically, uh, you know, the gaps, they don't have vegetation. And finally, so of course, you know, no, you know, so the, the assumption of all, all the three variables, right? You know, water, surface, uh, surface water, soil water, and the plants, they're all diffusing, right? Now, of course, no landscape is perfectly uh, flat. In fact, you know, if you're on a mountain slope, you have a slope, right? What happens on a slope? The, 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 the surface water would, in addition, would predominantly move along the slope, downward slope, right? Now, one can also incorporate that by what term, by the way? If the, on a flat surface, you have a diffusion, what would you, how would you model water moving along a slope? What kind of a spatial term will you include? Like Do you remember bias. the, huh, sorry? Like a biased uh, term? Ah, which... right. You know, there's a bias in the water movement now, right? So what does bias random walk lead to? Drift term, right? The gradient term. So you can, instead of diffusion, you can just add a gradient term to the differential equation. And then, and if you do that, this is what you get. What do you define now? It's a banded vegetation pattern. Now, if we were to go back to this, okay, do you think there is some resemblance to this? This banded vegetation pattern. Okay, so, and in fact, along the hill slopes, you do often find these kind of vegetation patterns in many of the semi-arid ecosystems, okay? And in fact, if I'm right, even if you go to, you know, arid landscapes in India, like, you know, uh, for example, extreme slope, like, you know, Ladakh, you again find, you know, small bushes that are lining up on these lines, okay? Okay, so that shows, you know, how this model can capture in principle, uh, many of the, you know, a lot of interesting patterns we sort of find in nature. It doesn't, however, does it, necessarily mean that the observed patterns do follow Turing instability? Uh, well, answer is very easy. You know, it doesn't. You know, it's entirely possible that the actual mechanism is more complex and not really Turing instability. Uh, but nevertheless, it provides a possibility. Okay. Okay. So, so these are the questions to ponder. How do we know that a given pattern is indeed, a given pattern, I mean, you know, Turing-like pattern is indeed given by Turing instability. Okay, remember the conditions that are required, right? You know, diffusivity of that activator must be much higher. And then there is this activator inhibitor dynamics itself. Okay, so one question I'm going to ask you in the assignment is, um, are these, this vegetation water system, can it be thought of as activator inhibitor system? Okay, 
okay and then one can also ask you know can you create a synthetic turing system and if so what are all the parameters you can sort of what would you need to achieve such a turing uh, pattern okay and then one can ask you know now you know real the existing system have a lot more complexity how do how do realist you know how do the fact fa features like stochasticity in the rainfall stochasticity in the season, you know seasonality in the rainfall or even heterogeneity in the landscape how do all of those affect the observed turing patterns okay those are the questions to ponder i won't answer them maybe i can give you one of them as an assignment question so i will provide you some references you know you should look at uh, some references some sort of you know um, technical references and uh, you know of course there is turing's paper okay so with that i stop today's uh, sort of uh, uh, class and take any more questions so the rainfall function which you took that was a constant ha huh. so rainfall i took was you know uh, in this model right r for a r is once you give a, you know sort of once you specify r it is fixed yes but for the across these parameters so they so for example this pattern happened because the model was run for a fixed value of rainfall but for long enough time another something similar here huh? something similar here so r is the only influx into the system right exactly yes yes so then uh, it uh, the surface water would be the um, like activator which can self replenish yeah think about it yeah yeah is surface water the activator uh, is uh, soil water the activator or is pond the activator and who is the inhibitor think about it huh? okay any other questions um in the model like uh, uh, all the things like the gradient the rainfall and the surface water distribution and all this like can be measured experimentally so ha, why so many, has it ha, not ha. been like measured for a large patch and um, like the numerical simulation of that and verified whether it exactly matches with the experimental pattern or not yeah um ha huh. so many of the parameters like k w they are all inspired by various previous studies okay uh, so i think the the trickiest part to sort of model here i think is the movement of water and how the uptake actually happens okay so those are the harder ones to sort of model uh, you know uh, there are many other forms of spatial gradients people use to sort of uh, you know um, rather than just diffusion you know diffusion is I mean, you know i think if you talk to an eco hydrologist they will just say diffusion is plain wrong okay uh, you know uh, so you know yeah but the question is you know we know that everything is wrong in the model anyway okay now the only question is you know is this reasonably wrong <laughs> no is it still reasonable okay so i'll stop here um so i will upload these references and there will be no class on friday because it's a holiday uh, and we'll meet on next monday okay and i'll start the new topic on next monday and there will be one assignment that now captures diffusion and you know uh, both the diffusion single population and two population systems thank you everyone bye